it's my pleasure to introduce Matthew Emery, my former postdoc, who is off doing new and better things, I guess, <laughs> sadly. Um, at least sadly for me, but good for him. Uh, at any rate, um, Matthew is currently an assistant research scientist uh, professor at um, Binghamton University. Correct. I always try not to say SUNY Binghamton, which is how I know it as. So I know they're now the university or Binghamton University. Um, so he's going to speak with us today about uh, research he, he did while he was here at ASU um, in my lab. So it's great to have him back. Um, there will be questions at the end. However, you will notice that I will be running out the door at the end because I have a plane to catch. So I'm going to let him be his own moderator. Um, so I apologize for that. It's not any reflection on him. It's just I have to catch a plane. So uh, anyway, thanks, Sam. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Oh, God, I'm, I'm I'm good. I'm like yeah. okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anne. And it's great to see so many familiar faces in the audience. Um, going to talk to you a little bit about the research that I did while I was here and after I, I left here. It's been an ongoing project uh, since 2018. We've actually just finally wrapped it up as of late. Um, so I first became interested in uh, the effects of environmental stresses on bone during my PhD when I was a, a grad student at McMaster University. Um, I studied uh, Roman bioarchaeology, in particular, applying ancient DNA methods to get DNA from uh, ancient Romans. So it's effectively like the uh, 23me or ancestry.com for Southern Italians. And um, from there, I, I was looking for uh, uh, the, the capacity to apply these kind of methods to more pragmatic and practical uh, projects. And when I saw the, the job call for Arizona State show up, I thought this would be a great way to kind of apply these methods in a new uh, context. So uh, I've been thinking about the, the, the applications of ancient DNA to uh, burn human remains now for the last five or six years. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the results we've got from this ongoing project. So basically, um, a very, very, and very simply, the, the main question we, we, we posed was how does pyrolysis or heat induced effects um, impact the quality and quantity of, of DNA that we get from burned human remains from forensic contexts. Um, so we went about doing this by applying two extraction techniques, so a comparative extraction technique, one ancient that's commonly employed in paleogenetic analysis and another that's commonly used in uh, forensic sciences. Very briefly, I'm going to go over just quickly, and I should say as a disclaimer, really, which I should have said at the beginning, that there will be some images of human remains. Um, so just, just a forewarning of that, um, that the body undergoes a systematic number of changes when it's, um, uh, when it's undergoing a process of thermolysis. So that normally takes the form of uh, desiccation of soft tissues first. So the shrinking of skin, muscle, tendons, um, which leads to a particular posture called the pugilistic pose. So it basically brings the, the the appendages in towards the body, curls the fingers, bows the legs, uh, that we call this pugilism. Uh, paleontologists actually see the same effects in uh, certain uh, dinosaur assemblages. If you get a, a nice complete dinosaur, uh, basically you'll see the head thrown back and the tail whipped up, and that's because of desiccation of those tenants pulling the head back and the tail up. So it's a similar kind of phenomenon, but obviously uh, different environmental factors here uh, applied to these remains. Um, I should also say that the, the areas that are exposed to fire are going to burn quickest and first, whereas those areas that are um, more protected even by the body burn last. So say the, the ventral portion of your metacarpals and phalanges basically will burn first, but the dorsal portion will burn later on as the body is consumed more and more by fire. So there are a number of contexts in which we find burned human remains. Um, none of these points are, are mutually exclusive. Um, so structural fires, vehicular fires, uh, forest and open fields, obviously forest fires and open field fires could lead to structural fires and vehicular fires. This was the case of uh, the recent fires in Maui and the California wildfires back in 2018. Uh, homicide cases. So uh, 
every every now and then a perpetrator will try to conceal their crimes by burning the evidence, trying to burn the remains. Um, suicide, self-immolation, and this is usually done as a means of protesting uh, for political reasons. Uh, crematorial war zones, mass disasters, and terrorist attacks. It doesn't, we can think probably of a few examples of that also as of late, and archaeological sites. In fact, uh, we find burn human remains and middens and, and a whole bunch of different funerary deposits in archaeological contexts. Um, the first attempt to understand uh, burning on, on the skeleton was done by an archaeologist back in the 1950s, Dr. Baby, looking at uh, Hopewell cremations from the Ohio River Valley. And so we've been thinking about the impacts of burning on, on bone for the better part of 75 years now. Um, but I will return to the point later in, in that uh, there's a very little standardization across the field of, of burning and pyrolytic taphonomy in, forensics, in the forensic sciences. So, you know, the, the histologists are doing one thing, the, the biochemists are doing another thing, the geneticists are doing another thing. So I'll touch on that a little bit more. But we've been, we've been thinking about this for a very long time. So forensic geneticists are primarily interested in applying the, the, the methods that are, that are well validated um, through, uh, sorry, qPCR analysis, so the establishment of a concentration of remains. Um, some of you probably well know the CODIS markers, so the CODIS SDRs that uh, the FBI, for example, are, are, are interested in, in, in amplifying. Uh, I think the profile, the number of profiles now established by the FBI is over 23 million, so the database is getting quite large. We're also interested in uh, um, ascertaining uh, mitochondrial DNA. And traditionally, this is through the amplification of the hypervariable regions. So the areas of the mitochondrial genome that have those diagnostic steps that are formative for ancestry on the maternal side. Um, and there's also a wide number of uh, available commercial uh, kits, multiplex kits, that use single base extension assays to, 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 to get at forensically relevant SNPs. So SNPs uh, associated with um, phenotype, blood type, individual identity, ancestry, and the like. So what does ancient DNA have to offer uh, in this particular case? Well, there's, um, there's, a, there's a great deal of co-optimization, I think, uh, between the two fields. Uh, forensic genetics is a little bit slower, in a sense, in terms of its optimization and it, the, the turnover in the field, because it's, it's, it's regulated. There's more medical, legal, stringent efforts to confine the validation of certain protocols so they can be established in court. While ancient DNA is, is, is kind of free-flowing, right? It, it, it optimizes readily. There's a lot of research going on um, to, 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 to always pushing for better extraction techniques, very sensitive single, double-stranded DNA library prep techniques, array-based and solution-based targeted enrichment techniques, and then, of course, coupled with next-generation short-read sequencing, it's like a match made in heaven for ancient DNA analysts, right? So there are a number of, of limitations that the two fields share. One is low sample representation. So in the case of uh, sometimes in forensic cases, you have maybe you know, one, one piece of hair to work with or very, very limited amounts of material to work with. And, and the same goes for you know, precious archeological materials in the same way we don't wanna go about destroying any of those materials. So we wanna minimize the amount of destruction uh, moving forward. Low DNA yields often comes with very low material input. Um, so that's always an issue. And in the case of ancient DNA, we're always dealing with these very degraded, environmentally stressed remains. So uh, that's always an issue. Inefficient DNA extraction methods, maybe not inefficient so much as just different DNA extraction methods, which I'll touch on later in the talk. Uh, short DNA fragments. So as, the, as environmental stressors increase, D DNA degrades to a greater degree. Um, and in fact, um, it doesn't have to actually be that way. The hair on your head, the hair shaft contains DNA, but it's on, on average about 50 base pairs in length. So for the longest time, forensic science, scientists were trying to amplify DNA from rootless hair shafts and they were getting no data. And so it wasn't until next generation sequencing came along that we were able to engineer those molecules and sequence them directly, right? So um, just kind of avoiding detection for the longest time in that respect. Um, ancient DNA analysts are also interested in quantifying damage, damaged molecules through five, three prime terminal deamination. So these transitions that occur, cytosines to uracils that are, that are then sequenced to thymines um, on the five prime and then G to A's on the three prime. And this gives us an idea of the amount of uh, 
hydrolytic damage in time, basically. Inefficient QPCR multiplex STR assay design, this kind of falls in line with the short DNA fragments, right? If our template molecule is too short and our assays are too long, we're not going to be able to amplify anything, right? And this still goes with, uh, for the case with degraded molecules and long, really long STR markers that the FBI is very interested in. That leads to allelic and low side dropout. And of course, contamination sample mixing is always something to be concerned about. So very, very generally, just to give you a broad overview of our project design, we collected uh, samples from the Office of the Medical Examiner here in uh, Maricopa County, Phoenix, Arizona. And we once arrived here, we, we sampled them according to their burn category. An aliquot of each of the bone powder was then extracted using one of these two extraction methods. The extracts themselves were then sent to ASU West Campus for genotyping and um, quantification. An aliquot of the extracts were converted to double-stranded DNA libraries and then enriched for mitochondrial DNA and whole genome SNPs. So that's basically the entirety of the workflow. We've kind of slowly been publishing on as the data has been trickling uh, out from that. So you're probably wondering, what, is, what do you mean by burn, burn category? So we sampled them according to their bone discoloration patterns because bone discoloration patterns are intimately tied to the temperatures at which they're subjected to and also the oxygen availability. So we tried our best to get um, as many subsamples from our oops, my bad, from our from our representative individuals as we could. So we got a total of 107 subsamples from 27 fire-related victims from Maricopa County. Um, so as you probably can deduce, multiple individuals produced multiple subsamples. So we got many different subsamples from different burn categories and sampled from across the 27 individuals. So the extraction protocols, I'm going to touch briefly on the differences between the two. How many people here have done an extraction, DNA extraction? Strawberries and bananas? Right, yeah. Um, so basically the two we used here, one employed uh, at the ICMP, the, the, Interna the International Commission for Missing Persons at the Hague, and uh, the FBI has traditionally used this Loray AL 2010 extraction protocol. It's colloquially known as the Total Demineralization Protocol. This protocol uses a large volume of EDTA to break down the mineral constituent of bone. And then thereafter, it's basically spun through an amicon column. And the rest is effectively a Kyogen DNEZ extraction after that. The Dabney AL protocol was, um, mo was modified to get really, really short DNA fragments at first published by Dabney AL in 2013 from a 750,000 year old short face cave bear. Um, and this protocol uses large volumes of guanidinium hydrochloride, so chelating the salt, uh, which ultimately changes the um, pH of the binding buffer so that the molecule, the, when the molecule is absorbed to the silica membrane, it's preferentially selecting shorter molecules. After that, you know, you run your, your two ethanol washes, right, your 80% ethanol. Kyogen calls it PE, but we all know it's 80% ethanol. You do your dry spin. Then you add your, your weak molar tris to release DNA in solution, and booyakasha, you've got your, your extract ready to go. So those are the, basically the two protocols we used. Um, we then employed two commercially available kits, uh, the ProMega PowerPlex ESX-17 Fast Systems kit. That's really hard to say. Uh, it co-amplifies 16 STRs plus amelogenin for sex estimation. And this quantifier our trio kit, which is basically a QPCR assay kit that we use to generate quantitation data from, from our, our bones and teeth. So really quickly, I just wanted to deviate for a second to give you an idea of how to interpret an STR profile, because uh, CSI definitely won't go over this part. Um, so let's hypothetically assume that we've got our perpetrator. He's in custody, or she is in custody, and um, they're a suspect in a murder case. We collect a buckle swab from them and we extract DNA from it. We generate some SCR data. We go down to the, the scene of the crime. We collect a bunch of evidence, hair, semen, skin, blood, anything that we could use. We extract DNA from that. We run uh, another set of STRs. And what we do is we get this profile here. Okay, so this individual is heterozygous for four loci, homozygous for one loci, in order to calculate the random match probability, which is what scientists are interested in doing, uh, we need to figure out what the allele frequencies are for those repetitive alleles, and then quantify using uh, the trusty old Hardy-Weinberg equation to figure out the genotype frequency. 
then we multiply the genotype frequencies together and that gives us a profile uh, frequency. In this case, uh, for this example, it's 4.2 times 10 to the seven, that's one over 42 million. So the chances that anybody else has this same combination of alleles for this, these set, this set of loci is one in 42 million, okay? So if you increase the number of STRs, so you get 10, 13 of the core CODIS STRs, you're upwards now into like one over the number of stars in the Milky Way galaxy, right? So in order to, to, to prosecute the individual, this, this actually wouldn't be enough to do it, right? One over 42 million, it's still not enough. It's an exclusionary probability to get this person convicted. Anyways, we didn't do that. I just wanted to take a side note and, and talk about that for a quick second. Um, but this is some of the data we generated from our, quant our quantification. The Dabney extracts are in red, the Larray are in blue. Uh, we are generating on average, you know, six nanograms per microliter across for, for burn category one, dropping uh, to about three nanograms for the Dabney for two. We see a spike and increase for the Larray extracts. I will get to that later on. And then uh, by burn category three, we're less than one nanogram per microliter, four, we're into the picograms, and five, we're not getting much DNA at all. Um, so the bottom figure here on the left shows you the number of, of STR profiles amplified, full for the red, uh, full Loray for the blue, and then the gray are partial Dabneys. So we're getting comparable number of STR profiles being generated between these two extraction protocols across burn categories one through three. And then we get this substantial drop by burn category four. So we've got one profile from each and then a partial Dabney. And then surprisingly, we got two partial Dabney profiles represented by three STRs that are terribly called uh, mini STRs. So what does that look like in an electroferogram? So this is a burn category four sample, burn category five. The top profile is the Dabney extract, bottom Loray. Top Dabney, bottom Loray. So what we're seeing here is uh, that for a burn category four sample, our, our Dabney extracts are, are performing, performing very well. There's this characteristic ski slope pattern that's commonly observed in degraded DNA template that's been STR amplified. But for the Loray, there's basically stutter peaks and, and, and just a bunch of noise. For the uh, burn category five sample, we have a mini STR D10S. So to get around some of the short degraded template molecules, they're now designing STRs that are uh, assays that are smaller. So they're, they're bringing the primers closer to the repeat region and they're shrinking them a little bit, right? So this one's about 125 base pairs. Uh, unlike the FGA locus, which can span anywhere between 250 and 400 base pairs, right? So problematic if you're dealing with really, really degraded DNA. So, so far we, we, we see that there's something going on between burn category three and four. And we're gonna, we're gonna see this pattern happening over and over again with, with the data. So basically we, we ran um, double-stranded DNA protocol and, and modified NEB. Um, so we uh, uh, basically ligated our adapters. We, we blunt end repaired using an exonuclease, polynucleotide kinase. We uh, adapted, our, our molecules and then ran our dual indexes off those adapters. And that's basically our shotgun library, right? So after that, we then employed a in-solution uh, capture, panels designed by Arbor Biosciences, our friends in, in Ann Arbor. And really briefly, just to give you an idea of what that looks like, um, you can look at this animation here that I got from Dr. Stone. And I've been using it ever since, so thank you, Anne. Um, so basically, this is our, our blunt-ended DNA molecule. We ligate our adapters. We extend our indices. And this is our shotgun construction, right? If we're looking to target a, a particular region of a genome, then we flood our index library with RNAs, synthetic RNAs designed to target those particular regions. So we flood a reaction, we let it hybridize overnight. These RNAs are biotinylated, so there's a little piece of biotin on it. Once that's done, the next day we come in, we add streptavidin beads. Those beads will bind to the biotin. We then add our PCR tubes to a magnetic rack, and those um, will then migrate to the sides. What's left here is not you know, nothing. You can 
you can get rid of it if you want. It's still an index library. You can use it to target something else or you can shotgun sequence it, it's up to you. Um, but you remove it, amplify directly off the bead and sequence. So we use two, two panels. The first, the mitochondrial DNA panel, comprised of 197 mitochondrial DNAs from all over the world. Um, and a whole genome STIP panel designed by uh, Dr. Odile Loray, who's also the, the designer of the extraction protocol that we used in this paper uh, or for across our projects. And within that bait set contains SNPs that uh, are, are have a high probability of being associated with individual identity, phenotype, hair, skin, eye color, ancestry, and blood type. We sequenced uh, here at ASU's genomics core facility in biodesign. Um, we sequenced all the mitochondrial and rich libraries on the MySeq across six pools, 25 million reads per, per pool. So about a total of 150 million reads resulting for that. Uh, two high output runs on an XC 550, that's 400 million reads. So we ended up to the total amount of reads for the whole project was about 950 million that we had to work with. So um, that's basically what we did for, for our sequencing. We did it all here at ASU, there you go. Uh, not all of our data returned with an equal number of reads per library. Even though we you know, we did our best to control this during, during pooling, we pooled at equimolar concentrations. Um, but nonetheless, there were differences in the number of reads we got per library. So then we had to, so we, we decided that we would subsample the fast queues to normalize the, the amount of data going into the pipeline. Um, so we did that using CTK. So for the Mito uh, libraries, we did that to 10,000 reads. For the SIP and Rich libraries, we normalized to a million reads. Uh, most of the analysis was done on Agave, and we've now switched to Sol to do most of our analysis. Um, we also published a pipeline, a mitochondrial DNA assembly pipeline, uh, myself with the help of Suhail Kapoor. Um, so this pipeline is designed to trim map or trim merge map filter deduplicate map damage uh, assess heteroplasmy call mitochondrial haplogroups from the consensus sequences all the things that we would want in a pipeline that uh, would be useful. So this is on GitHub and this was also published as part of the the mitochondrial paper that we that we put out in 2020 2022 God, so long ago now. So what does this look like in, from the NGS side? So we use mapped, norm, our normalized mapped reads and our normalized depth of coverage to look at how the uh, libraries performed and we group them by their extraction type. So while there's no significant difference between the two, we see that there's eight Dabney extracted libraries that's driving variants in the Dabney group. I'm gonna return to this um, with the whole genome SNP data. We also looked at the depth of coverage across each burn category. And so for the first three burn categories, we're, we're, we're seeing a high depth of coverage, even for 10,000 reads. So we're anywhere between 50 and 100 and 160 X coverage at 10,000 reads. And we, I think I quantified it to be something like 60 to 80% on target from our enrichment. So very good. It, it, the, the enrichment performed really well, but there's a significant difference between burn category three and four. So there's that significant, and it's also significant between four and five. So there's something again, showing up in the data like the STRs, like the qPCR data that's telling us that there's something going on above 350 degrees centigrade. Now remember when I told you that we subsampled um, sometimes we had subsamples from different burn categories from the same individual. So this is an example of kind of sampling around the different burn discoloration patterns from one bone and the different amount of the differential amounts of data that you'll get from each of those depending on where you sample. So from a burn category two and three, you know, we're getting an equal amount of cover, a, a pretty good degree of coverage, 100 to 150x. By burn category four, again, we see those substantial drops. So even depending on where you're sampling in the bone, from that single bone, it's going to matter, right? Another thing we 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 noticed with our data is that um, going back to what I was talking about the, between the two extraction types, right? The the Loray using the large volume of EDTA, and the DAB using large volumes of guanidinium hydrochloride. The, the, this is a Dabney extracted library. So this normal distribution shifted to the left suggests a, sh a retention of shorter molecules off the column. Whereas this Loray extracted library, we see that there's almost an increase in the read length uh, in those insert sizes and then an abrupt uh, cutoff right at the paired end read chemistry of the kits we were using, right? So that, that, that tells me that our molecules were longer than the read chemistry we used to sequence, right? So. Um, effectively, what am I trying to say? I'm just saying that the extraction protocols are, are doing exactly what they're designed to do. DNA from a, a 750,000-year-old short-phase cave bear 
DNA for 400 BP STR from forensic context, right? So extraction type does matter. We also assessed uh, DNA damage in our libraries using Map Damage 2.0 and Damage Profiler. Um, this is one huge authenticating criteria in ancient DNA uh, breakdown of the, the phosphate backbone leading to deperonation and hydrolytic damage of the sites, leading to C to T's and an increase in fragmentation of the DNA, DNA molecule. We can actually quantify those C to T's and that gives us an idea of their sort of authenticity, right? We don't want to, because contaminating molecules or other, other molecules that we don't want might not contain these C to T's and we don't want to use those in our alignments. Um, but our libraries, unfortunately, did not show any of that kind of damage. Um, I mean, again, fire is acute. There's not a lot of time. De uh, deamination takes time to accumulate. It takes water, right? So what is there not in fire? A lot of time and, and some water. Besides body water, you're the water from your body, but not, not enough to make any significant changes there. We called ha uh, the haplogroups from our mito-enriched libraries at a 3x depth of coverage and 10% missing data. So that means breadth of coverage across the genome. So anything in our consensus sequences, if we had more than, you know, what the mitogenome's 16,569. So anything more than 1,659 ends, we just kicked out. Um, and that gave us a really high haplogrep quality score to move forward with. And the, the, the diversity is, is what you'd expect from a big metropolitan area like Phoenix, uh, maternal ancestry from uh, the Americas, Africa, and Eurasia. So now onto the SNP data. So that, again, we're seeing the same sort of patterns occurring. You're gonna see a spoiler alert. You'll see the same things happening here again. Um, we're using, we used a different pipeline. We thought about making our own SNP calling pipeline. We got eager, the fantastic, um, highly portable, really reproducible pipeline. I got my students at BU using this all the time. So they're always running eager on raw genomic data just for practice. Um, so this is what we use basically to get our SNP calls. Again, grouped by, by extraction type for uh, map reads against the HT38, the nuclear genome. Uh, there's no significant differences between the two, but again, we're seeing those eight DABME extracted libraries coming up, uh, the same ones from the MITO enriched libraries. And what's interesting is that these, are, these libraries have less than 100 milligrams of bone powder associated with them. So there is sort of a law of diminishing returns kind of baked into the extraction for it. You would think that the more bone powder you put into the extraction, the more DNA you're gonna get out on the other end. But it turns out that if you do that, you're increasing the co-extraction of inhibition. Uh, bone is composed of a lot of organics, right? Collagen, osteocalcin. So you're getting these really wet extracts that aren't really performing well. They clog the columns. As we know, we end up having to spin more than you'd like to, right? So this is one of the reasons why um, the, these libraries are, are, are performing a lot more because of their lower associated bone powder into the extraction effort. Uh, we tested two SNP calling algorithms, GATK, Genome Analysis Toolkit, and Freebase, uh, just to see if there were any differences. We found no difference between the two, and we ended up just going with the GATK uh, data because it's well-documented, uh, highly reproducible. A lot of people use it, so we went with that. Our mapped and filtered reads across berm categories for the uh, for the uh, mapped against the HT38, showing the same patterns again, significant difference between burn category three and four. This is also again consistent with the uh, the drop in STRs at burn category four, the drop in mitochondrial profiles. Uh, so we're seeing the same things uh, over and over again, and sampling within the same bone across the different bone discoloration patterns. And ironically, I'm showing you a circular a circus plot of the nuclear genome when I showed you a linearized version of the mito. We all know that mito is actually circular, um, but obviously we wouldn't be able to visualize the whole thing. But in any case, we're seeing a lot of, uh, a lot of data uh, for the first three burn categories and that significant drop between uh, four and five again. Okay, so I think you get it. Something's going on between 350 degrees and 550 degrees centigrade. I don't have any more figures I have to show about that. But we then turned our attention to looking at how many SNPs we could call by, by skeletal element, because this is something that forensic scientists might be interested in if they're confronted with a situation where they have either a full or partial skeleton and access to certain um, you know, skeletal elements. So they want to select the best ones, the best bang for the buck, if, especially if they're, they're investing their budgets into this. So we found that long bones, hand and foot bones, and teeth are ideal genomic reservoirs. This isn't um, anything new. The, the, this has been established in the literature. Thicker cortical bone, 
lot of osteons, denser osteocytes, more DNA. Okay, it's very simple. We also had uh, contact, meta contact data with the remains. I would take this one with a bit of a grain of salt because we don't really have the numbers to back it up. But uh, I just thought for the hell it would be fun to look at the number of SNPs associated with each of the contexts. And we get more SNPs with house, house fires, truck, train fires, less with airplane crashes, bush fires, 55 grunt cremains, burn, being burned in a dumpster fire. So basically, I mean, again, this is, well, these are contexts in which the fires are burning hot and long. And who's arriving here? The fire department, right? So there, those, those fires aren't burning to completion. So that could be one of the patterns that we're seeing in our data. And it'd be cool to get more information on that. We did some mixed effects modeling, uh, fixed effects for incident rate ratios uh, across using burn category and extraction type as our main predictors. Uh, a, a value of one would indicate that it's the same as a reference category, burn category one. Anything above it means a predicted increase or a predicted decrease with a, with a number lower than one. So with our burn category two samples, we see a predicted increase of 68% over burn category one, and that kind of reminds us that little uptick in the amount of DNA we're getting for those uh, burn category two samples. And again, this is something that I think we're, uh, we've seen, and I think uh, uh, Dr. Parker has also seen in, in, his, in his research in that um, burn category two samples are just drying up, that they might still contain enough DNA so that we're not co-extracting all those organics because the burn category one samples were, I got were very fresh. And so a lot of organics coming back from, from those ones. So that's probably the pattern we're seeing. The difference is trendy, it's approaching significance, but it's not significant. Uh, burn category three associated with a lower amount of predicted SNPs for, for, for that burn category, as we've seen in the data, um, uh, not significant. A burn category four, a drop at 80, 81%, and that is significant, and four and five. So our, our, our incident rate ratios, in terms of predicting the number of SNPs we should get is basically recapitulating and co corroborating our non-parametric statistics that we ran on, on the, compares, the pairwise comparison between burn categories. So um, interesting. So the, the Loray extraction at 0.69 is associated with a lower number of SNPs. It's not significant, it's trendy, but not significant. Um, so on average, we're getting more SNPs being um, called because of the higher on-target uh, on map reads from the DAPNI extracts. So that's also coming through. Uh, our random effects uh, basically characterized by skeletal element and our interclass correlation coefficient for that was 50, uh, 0.51. So 51% of the variability, the SNP variability is driven by uh, skeletal element. Also something that we know about because different bone, if you sample different bones for their DNA concentration, you're gonna get wildly different values. So this is also not surprising. Um, effect from our modeling. And with both the fixed and random effects taken into consideration, counting for 89% uh, of variance model. So pretty good fit. We called Y haplogroups in addition to the mitochondrial haplogroups and similar to the mito results we got, um, haplogroups on the paternal side uh, with ancestries from the Americas, Eurasia and Africa. Uh, again, seeing that same pattern over and over again in the data. So, so what are the key points here? Less is more. We don't need to inundate our extracts with a whole bunch of bone powder. Uh, we can use very little amounts of bone powder. So we don't co-extract that inhibition. We increase the amount of organics in our extracts. Not good for the column. Uh, both extraction methods are effective at generating adequate amount of uh, genomic data for SGR profiling, mitochondrial DNA analysis, whole genome, uh, SNP analysis. So all that's there. Uh, the temperature and skeletal element are driving the main or the differences between as, between the quality of our SGR profiles, mtDNA, and genomic SNP quality, uh, and that higher genomic yields are associated with long bones, feet, and hand bones, and teeth, and that there's this acute point of DNA degeneration uh, between 300 uh, degrees centigrade and 550 degrees centigrade. So it'd be it'd be great to narrow in that range to see exactly what's going in going on um, in that particular temperature category. So why do any of this? Why, why do any of this? Why I spend six years doing this? Um, so it's, it's better informed qualitative interpretations uh, based, based in high quality quantitative modeling. So we want uh, forensic scientists in the field or who have you know, low budgets, who don't have the, the, the budgets to do this kind of analysis to be able to select remains appropriately 
so that they can move forward with their analysis in a way that they're not just, you know, trying to sequence everything and wasting all that money. So if they've got, you know, bones that are that are discolored due, uh, due to fire and they have a certain range of skeletal elements to look at, they can, you know, look to our research and research like ours to make a be the best practices approach to, to selecting those remains to get the best bang for their buck in return. Um, ultimately, too, it would be great to model the geno genomic data with um, other methods and other techniques, such as bone bioappetite crystallization through FTIR analysis, X-ray diffraction, uh, Raman spectroscopy, stable isotope analysis. So there's a whole bunch of cheaper methods um, where, where that might be just as informative in a way for selecting certain skeletal elements or um, bones to move move through the process, especially on limited budgets. So um, that might be a, an interesting avenue in the future. I simulated some archaeological data with, um, uh, with including genomic and isotope data and FTIR data and separating out preser uh, preservation based on the quality of that data using a TSNE uh, clustering, unsupervised machine learning. And it's, it's, it's actually coming out quite well. So I'm hoping to employ more methods uh, to assess uh, preservation of low quality samples, degraded samples in the future. So um, yeah, that, without further ado, that's it. That's what I've got for you today. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, thank you. Any questions? Questions? Yeah. Yes. You didn't say much about time and future, I think, but is there, like, can you become a burn category four by being very, for a long time at a lower temperature, right? Like, is it is it just temperature? Or is it also time spent? Yeah, that's a great question and uh, something that's covered quite a bit in the literature. Um, so our, our analysis, this, this project was kind of like a first take on it and subsequent um, projects that uh, Dr. Stone and, and, and her uh, lab is working on is incorporating those the, the time aspect by controlled uh, burning of cadavers with their um, collaborators at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Body. So that is indeed the next step is to figure out um, whether or not that is a factor. And it is. It's just having a more systematic approach to understanding how that works is something that they're interested in quantifying. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, I have a small answer that I have in the actual slide. And what we found is that um, within the same body, you can have different um, burn categories. As we did, uh, we controlled burn higher with multiple thermal covers and burn from beneath all for two hours. And different scales, I'll mention the same individual have this in my um, burn categories. So it's kind of how the fire burns because fire is so chaotic. It just kind of depends. And it kind of depends on your body type as well. If you have more fat, you're going to burn way hotter than if you're yes. quite thin and things like that. Yeah, adipose is the, the ramp up the temperature. So, yes, time yes. matters, but it also depends. And these are more dependent on like the actual damage of the tissue or like the carbonization that you see. Yeah. That makes the category a category. Yes. Ellen, so, what's the difference between three and four, really? Uh, there's slight discolor. There's like a grayish hue effect that that starts to take over the the, the really dark carbonized uh, typification that's classified as burn category three. It becomes like this, um, like it's basically like a grayish sheen. Yeah, this is all basically macroscopic observational oh. stuff. <laughs> yeah, but there's also histological data that suggests you know the breakdown of hydroxyapatite, the recrystallization at certain temperatures, and the complete breakdown um, at the category five. At a cremation yeah. level temperature, yeah, yeah. First of all, it's really cool. Second, I think any of the questions that we're asking here make it seem like we're trying to figure out the best way to cover up something. My next will be like, how long does it take to really, yeah, really burn someone? Yeah, yeah. We we, we need crematorium, right? Yeah. So um, yeah, we played with titles that had that to that yeah. effect, like how to conceal it. Yeah. Uh, so, can, can, you, know, you talk about the two different approaches to getting the extraction of getting smaller dragons versus larger dragons. Is it best to combine them? Are they going to answer different questions? Yeah. When would you use one versus the yeah, other? Yeah, great question. 
Yeah, in, in um, I, I suppose cases that um, where you're looking at higher burn categories, you might want to opt for a dab in the extraction method, if, if particularly if you're going to try to if you're trying to get short fragments and you know that your those longer fragments are going to fail. If you like do some preliminary QC on a tape station, do a bioanalyzer, get those fragment like distributions, you can maybe make a better assessment of how to move forward with the STR genotyping. But yeah, um, um, in, in cases where the, the the remains are more burned, uh, you probably want the the dabney. And in cases where they're less burned and you want the, the longer STRs, you would employ the the, the other total demon protocol. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. Do anything for time since the burn and how that impacts? Ooh, that's so a new know, question. Could you use this to go back and solve some problems from the seventies and eighties where they never bothered to? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Versus, or is, is it going to actually cause some kind of degradation of DNA? Yeah. It's going to be harder to find that. Hmm. So, burning compounded by decades of consistent degradation. Yeah, I mean, that would definitely be, I think, play, play an issue. Um, we have another project that looks at cold cases. Um, so, cases that have, have kind of failed traditional approaches back, you know, decades ago that we're now able to employ newer. Technologies and generation sequencing to get at data that we couldn't get at previously. So, yeah, I think that's definitely a problem. We've been looking at how time affects um, already burned remains. That, that's a good question. Yeah. I would assume that you might see damage patterns eventually. If there was any DNA left from the burn, depending on how badly it's burned, we might eventually see that terminal deamination and ramp up the CDTs because of environmental impulse if it's been left out. Um, to the elements. Yeah. Um, I'm asking for a friend. Okay. But <laughs> how does the use of accelerants, does that like change Ooh, anything nice. in sampling? Like does it diminish samples or cause like greater degree of effect? I don't know. I don't know. But I've come across literature that does discuss that. And I didn't read it very well, obviously. Um, but in the context of our bones, um, I have no idea. You can't say you're asking. So you. <laughs> 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 so, so I, uh, yeah. I think you already answered it because I wanted to ask, like, how's your interaction with the Department of Justice or FBI, right? But you basically already mentioned that maybe you're helping with cold cases and things. So they, they do see like benefits or things that they are not doing. Yeah. Which would be helpful. I actually presented the. Uh, Preliminary version of this, and I was just doing when well, we just had the STR data at uh, the FBI headquarters at FBI Monaco. They were very interested in it. Yeah. Oh, cool. Um, so, yeah, our relationships are ongoing. Yeah. Is that why you're involved in the cold case? They said, like, try this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's definitely. Yeah. Cool. And I think they, they, there's there's a large number of unsolved cases in Maricopa County that I think could benefit greatly from, yeah. from these optimized techniques from ancient DNA. So, so they, they just give you some bone powder then? Is that? Is that how you receive your samples? We, well, we receive usually a oh. skeletal element, yeah. Oh, it's going to be yeah, nice. And then you... Yeah. 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 <laughs> exactly. But uh, no, we do the same. They usually give us a, a whole bone or something like that. Then we have to oh, yeah. drill and sample. Yeah. yeah, okay. That was my question. Yeah. Do you drill and then swab and take a sample, or do you take the bone and crush it and then use like like a small amount? Yeah, it depends. So Whatever you got. these are the complexities of, of, of yeah, of, of getting... The sampling done. So with, I, think, I don't know, maybe Eric can also encounter yeah. this, but. I own Mixer Mill for the project that followed this one. Um, so we sampled part of the bone and then some of the tissue was removed and kept, and then we took the that chunk and then cryomixed it. Mixer Mill into it and basically applied to others. And what we found also with this is that the more chunky it is, the crappier it is. But also, if the we're category one samples, and that are less than 200 degrees centigrade, they're, they're kind of still really wet when yeah. they're um, You can't pulverize very well with the, with the hammer, so we have to drill them. On the opposite spectrum for like cremations, yes. so you just, you're just taking kind yep. of a random scoop and they're, then you're going where it's coming from, yeah. or like what it is really? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. This seems like it could be used for like cultural resources for like tribal governments that handle remains, but it's also extremely taboo, I think. So I'm sure that they're not reaching out to yeah. like, take samples of their Yes. Is there any online? How do I feel online? Is there? Um, no, I don't think so. No? You're good? 
Yep. Cool. Well, thank you, everybody. It was great. Yeah. Thank you.